appreciate uh, everyone coming. Um, I'm especially grateful to our sponsors, the Muslim Student Union, thank you, Kaya Press, the Office of Religious Life, and the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity. Um, and it gives me great joy to welcome you all for this very special event celebrating the release of an extraordinary new book called Speaking for Ourselves, American Muslim Women on the Role of Faith in Identity Formation. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say how grateful I am to Professor Kathy Moore from UC Santa Barbara who's here. She's been a great mentor to so many young scholars of religion, including myself. Um, she's doing extraordinary work at UCSB. She hired me for my first teaching job there, so you can blame her uh, for that. <laughs> but uh, it's really kind, quite an honor for me to welcome her to USC. So thanks for being here, Kathy. This evening, we come together to celebrate the publication of uh, I Speak for Myself, and the format of the event will be uh, as follows. I'll have a moderated conversation with the contributors, three of the contributors to the book, then we'll do a Q&A with everyone in the audience, um, and then we'll be selling the book uh, afterwards, and you can buy a copy of the book, you can have it signed, um, and it's really an important and timely volume, so I encourage you all to pick up a copy. Muslim American women are the subject of endless discussions regarding their role in society, their veils as symbols of oppression or of freedom, their identity, their patriotism, their womanhood. Yet the voices and life experience of Muslim American women themselves are rarely heard in the loud rhetoric surrounding the questions of Muslims in America. Finally, in this book, 40 American women under the age of 40 share their experiences of their lives as Muslim women in America. While their commonality is faith and citizenship, their voices and their messages are very different. There are approximately six million Muslims living in the United States and over one billion around the world. But 12 years after 9-11, many enduring stereotypes continue to belittle the Muslim American experience. And this often leads to a monolithic interpretation and perception of Islam. Such a treatment is especially inappropriate when reflecting on the Muslim American identity, which is by far one of the most culturally, ethnically, and socially diverse of any in the Islamic world. Now, I believe that the future of Islam will not just be determined in Muslim-majority countries, but also right here in the United States, on the campuses of our research universities, in the mosques and community centers of our urban areas, and in the conversation and writings of our Muslim-American leaders. So we are very fortunate this evening to have three such uh, Muslim-American leaders with us today, three extraordinary women who will help us engage and interrogate the themes of their book. They will also share with us their intersectional identity formation processes as Muslim American women who are also Arab American, South Asian American, and African American. So now I'm happy to introduce you to our distinguished panel. Maria Ibrahamji is a journalist, writer, and speaker interested in the intersection of people and ideas. She is currently an executive editorial producer for CNN and vice chair of CNN's Diversity Council. Over the next two years, she will be advising the University of California Humanities Studio, entitled Sharia Revoiced, Documenting American Muslim Experiences of Islamic Law, a project that will document how Muslims from all walks of life interpret and live out their Islamic identities. She received her BA in Mass Communications from Brunau Women's College, a master's degree in International Affairs from Georgia State University. Please join me in welcoming to USC, Maria Ibrahimji. Thank you, Maria. Dr. J Jamila Medina is a educator, author, orator, and business owner residing in Southern California with her husband and her daughter. She is currently a university administrator for the Claremont Colleges. She is the author of several publications, including a book, academic journal articles, newspaper articles, book chapters, and essays, as well as articles on a variety of blogs. She is currently a monthly contributor to feminism and religion. Please join me in welcoming to USC Jamila Medina. Thank you, Jamila. And our very own May Al Hassan is a USC Provost PhD Fellow in American Studies and Ethnicity. She studies the historical encounters between black internationalism uh, and the Arab diaspora, critical race studies, and transnational social movements. Her work in and outside academia bridges the worlds of social justice, academic research, and artistic expression. She received her BA in political science and Arabic and Islamic studies with honors from UCLA, but we'll forgive her for that. Um, <laughs> She also received her master's in anthropology from Columbia University, and she's a doctoral candidate right here at USC. She has written for CNN, The Huffington Post, Counterpunch, and other outlets on Muslim, uh, on Middle East politics, on the prison industrial complex, and the Arab uprisings. Please join me in welcoming May Al-Hassan. Thanks, May. 
So I'm going to start uh, with Maria. Um, you are a co-editor of this volume, and it's a series. I speak for myself as a series. And it's, um, I think, set up to, in some ways, challenge and deconstruct some of the common stereotypes we have, in this case, about Muslim American women. What drew you to the project, um, and how have people reacted to the book? So thank you, Varun. Um, the, the book actually, it never really started as a series. It started as a, an idea. <laughs> um, I think you all heard that I, I love to be at the intersection of people and ideas. That's what I do in my job at CNN. I, I find really interesting people and put them on air um, only for five, five to ten minutes usually at a time. Um, but I was actually in the living room of my dear friend Zara Suratwala, who's the co-editor of the book and my partner now, and I speak for myself, Inc., um, it was a, a winter winter weekend in Chicago back in 2005, and this really just started with an idea like, hey, let's do something together. What do we share in common? We both share a love of writing. What else do we share in common? We're both Muslims. We're both women. And, and then we kind of explored this idea of, you know, well, let's write a book together. And so what would that book be, you know? And, and, and that's sort of it really is how it came about. I and mean, we decided to write a book together. And one of the voids that we both saw, um, not just in our community, but in terms of the literature out there about Muslim American women, was uh, narratives by and uh, by Muslim American women themselves. I mean, if you look at a lot of the literature post 9-11 written about the Muslim American community, a lot of it is by journalists who covered uh, post 9-11, who covered the Muslim American community but weren't necessarily Muslim themselves. And uh, any of the theological approaches to it were written by people who weren't Muslim. And um, I think one of the things that was missing was sort of this idea of people from our community, my community, really speaking for themselves about what their Islam meant to them and how they live out their Islam every day. And our approach to this book was simply that, you know, tell your story. And we came up with, you know, it, it started as 50 under 50, and then we thought, well, that maybe that's too many people. And then we were like, maybe 15 under 15 or, you know, but there, no. Um, but we were actually thinking about 30 under 30, and then I realized that I didn't quite, that wouldn't work around the location. So, so we ended up with 40 under 40, and I think that really um, is very representative of the generation that sort of came of age post 9-11 and um, also representative of those of us like me who were very early in our careers when 9-11 happened and um, have really grown up, not just in our Islam, but grown up in terms of our maturity about how to approach our religion in a public space. And I think that's really what this book encapsulates. And, and what happened with the book is essentially it created what we, what we saw as we were publishing that book. Um, we already had this idea that this wasn't enough. Um, you know, we had my my cousins and uncles saying, "Well, what about us?" You know, um, there has to be something for Muslim men, and so it was then. It was actually in the process of publishing the first volume that we already had decided that we were going to continue to do that. And and we really believe that I speak for myself is a platform, a narrative platform, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to say that it it is encompassing of both interfaith, inter and intrafaith titles, but also intercultural and intracultural titles. I mean, our next volume, volume four, will be publishing in mid-October, and it's called Talking Taboo, American Christian Women Get Frank About Faith. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for the, for the first time, you're going to see in that collection a, a group of women under 40 from the Christian American community, all denominations, really talking and addressing some of the, the unspoken in their churches, and, and that's not really ever been done before. Um. You both contributed to this volume. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your pieces in the volume and why you chose to write about what you wrote about? And I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of, you know, um, approaches, methodologies, stories that you could have shared. Why did you write what you wrote about? Actually, it was kind of a struggle for me to find the story mm -hmm. to write about. And I was going back and forth with Zahra um, just through email. We hadn't even met each other or had a phone conversation. and. Things didn't feel like they were clicking for me. And then I had um, contributed some pieces to an art show at Columbia, student-run art show, and it was the conversation was around, or the exhibit was about impressions or images of God. And so I, I had to think about what God meant to me. And at that moment when I was at Columbia, um, I was in my mid-20s, and I actually was returning back to my faith. I had been a, an avowed atheist when I was 
at university at UCLA. UCLA didn't do it to me, you guys. Don't worry about it. Um, but you know, I went through that typical process of trying to be a scholar and learn about the world. And in the process, I had lost my faith. And then I moved to New York, 3,000 miles away from anything that I knew or was familiar with. And I just somehow very slowly and incrementally started to rediscover my faith and to return back. And then I had created an art piece about, um, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's, it's interesting, so bear with me. There's um, a surah in the Quran that talks about returning safely from a journey. And actually, I think I have it here. Surah Al-Qasas. It says, verily, he who ordained the Quran for you will bring you back to the place of return. Say, my Lord knows best who it is that brings true guidance and who is in manifest error. So the interesting thing is some households take the surah and if somebody is about to travel, they'll write in Arabic on a wall inside the house. And so when I had lost my faith, um, I never continued that. And one day I was going back, I was back home from New York and I was back at my parents' house and I just pulled back the curtains and I saw that my mom had been writing it for me. So every time I had left, she would write the, the surah, the verse from the surah on the wall. And that touched me, so I took a picture of it and then I wrote something over it and I used that for the art exhibit. And after I did the art exhibit, I was like, this is it, my story is about a story a lot of us have gone through, which is losing faith and coming back. And this concept of the return in Islam was also really compelling to me because it just, it was operating on a mystical dimension and also it was very literal, like <laughs> I was returning back home and then I somehow returned to my faith. Jamila, same question. Why, wh wh what did you write about and why? So my essay in the book is titled uh, University of Life. And I really decided to talk about my position in Islamic America, Muslim America, as an African American. And I chose the juxtaposition of being black and not quite accepted in Arab majority mosques. Um, and also not quite Muslim enough for some, and then for some African Americans and uh, Americans who are non-Muslim, not being quite American enough or not being quite whatever enough. So kind of being in the middle of things. And I also struggled with what was I going to write about. And I originally wanted to write about um, a situation of domestic violence with my ex-husband. And I thought, well, maybe someone will write about that. And someone actually did, which is why I'm glad I didn't choose that story. And uh, so I chose my story thinking, wondering how many African-American women were going to participate in the book and thinking there would probably be five out of 40 maybe. And that's about right. I think there are more than that, though. And I wasn't sure what their perspective would be if they talk about race and racism and colorism in their pieces or not. So I said, OK, I'm going to talk about from a very vulnerable and hurtful place from my experiences being a third generation Muslim. I. I talked about those instances where I'm asked, um, or it's automatically assumed that I'm a convert, or it's assumed that I don't know how to pray, or can you please recite Al-Fatiha if you're really Muslim? Those kinds of questions that I've had from Muslims. And, or the treatment, my um, best friend, we look a lot alike. We're both big women, tall women. She wears a scarf, but her skin is white. She's Afro-Cuban, but she's very pale, and you can't tell. So the treatment that we would get was very different when we would enter mosques together. She was a convert, but she'd be treated as one of them, either Turkish or Arab American or something else. And I was the other that was kind of literally like her shadow and uh, ignored, not invited to sister's dinners or halakas and stuff like that. Um, and then also on the other side of things, always having to justify wearing a headscarf with my strong personality as a black woman, how could you, how could you tame yourself or how could you be so subdued and all of these other assumptions that came from people in mainstream society where suddenly I wasn't just African American. After 9-11 it became I was now Muslim. I had always been, but now that was the main identity that people focused on. So my essay really talks about those two things. It, I wanted to critique Islam in America, Muslims in America, and how we deal with each other based on race, ethnicity, and color, 
because I also didn't want it to be a book of 40 Muslim women saying, we're so awesome, we're so great. <laughs> I didn't know what the other essays would look like. So I, I always like to be self-reflective and challenging myself um, and being vulnerable because that way we, we get better. So in that book, I wanted to make sure that my essay dealt with my true struggle and hopefully it would speak to some women in the same situation. <clears throat> Excuse great. me, same situation. Thank you. I think what this volume does is it really um, highlights the importance of storytelling, especially in a post-modern, post-colonial context, that in fact, storytelling can be transformative in terms of social advocacy and change. And I, 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 in the work that you all do, even outside of this volume, you're all storytellers, as journalists, as scholars, as educators, and then you tell your stories in this in this volume. Can you talk a little bit about the role of storytelling in your life and in your work, and um, the importance of telling new stories about yourself and about our world. And maybe we can start with Jamila. So I came into storytelling kind of as a tool of survival. So I come from a history um, that involves abuse and struggles and lots of different not so good things. So, and I spent a lot of my younger life in silence, so pretending and putting on the face that everything was okay, I'm a star student excelling in school, there's no problems with me, everything's fine. And so there was that silence that I never talked about and, or that I never spoke through. So finally when I found started finding my voice, I found healing through telling stories. And in the beginning a lot of the stories were about me because of course I spent so many of my years not talking. Um, I was like stone cold ice queen type person, but underneath really I was just like this broken little girl crying for help, but crying with no sound kind of thing. So telling my story, I would write stories under other people's names or using characters as if it were fiction, but it was actually real. So that let me be a little braver and say, okay, I'm going to really tell this person's story. But it, I started feeling the weight lifted, like the burden lifting. So the more I told my stories um, that had good endings, even th though there were struggles, the more I found people who related to those stories. So that let me know, okay, there are so many of us who are living these same stories in our own storybooks, and we're not sharing the information that can help someone, or at least provide solidarity. Oh, I know what you've been through. I know what you're going through. Oh, I never thought of it like that, putting it in a positive light. Um, so for me, storytelling, it helped me, but I also saw how throughout my life when I do share different stories about myself now and about others through my research as well. It really resonates with different people and it helps them along their own path. Well, I'm a lover of listening to stories and great stories, so I'm sitting here and listening to you, Jamila, and I'm like, yeah, okay, tell me more. <laughs> I want to know more. It's a tool of survival. I love that. Um, and I also, um, I really value storytelling as, um, as Oh, means to healing. That's that's something else. But um, for me, initially, storytelling was how I got to experience my Syrian lineage. So my father loved telling stories, and um, my parents come from Syria. My mother didn't really remember things that well, but my father could remember the exact date something happened. If it was June 21st, 1956, he could tell you what happened that exact day, and it would propel a narrative for him. So I just remember growing up and being at the dinner table and my father would regale us with some sort of story that was pertinent to something that happened today from his past. And um, we didn't ever really go back to Syria in the summer, so this was the only way that I got to connect to the country was through my father's stories. And I didn't even realize that it had such um, an indelible effect on me until I went to Syria and I saw that I, I did feel a connection to my roots and I didn't go until I was 22. And um, the other thing that I love about storytelling is, just as Jamila had touched on, it is a source of healing, not just for individuals, but for communities. And coming into the, acad uh, the academic world, I just, I, I was so disillusioned because I felt like I was constantly having to have conversations that felt irrelevant because I had to reference back books and I had to reference back scholars who were disengaged from the community. So um, I, I really lean towards stories, uh, oral history, narratives, and narratives in general, and try to collect those stories from either Arab American communities 
Muslim communities or, you know, projects that I'd done on Malcolm X's travels to the Middle East. Um, and that's also been a methodology that I've been trying to use academically for my work is trying to interview people because what's really interesting, you know, just addressing you as a community, if you think about where you go back home, um, what's sad is in, in academia, we don't have your stories from your communities. So you are in the position to create that archive. And um, we're, not, we're not necessarily doing that. There is a movement happening, just like Maria's talking about and Jamil is talking about as well. Um, but this is something that I have been passionately committed to in my own academic research. Oh, and also, I, I forgot about this. There is a third book to this volume. It's called Demanding Dignity, and it's about the Arab uprisings. And I was like, there, there was some Arab stories I collected. What was it? I completely had forgot about that. It's only the co-editor. <laughs> so Maria had talked about that um, there was the series had continued on. So the the Talking Taboo is the fourth book, and the second book is Muslim men speaking about their faith, and the third book is about youth from the Arab world who had used social media in some sort of capacity and were organizers and activists writing their stories about the revolutions that took place in their country. So Maria had approached me about being a co-editor and that was an incredible process. It was a protracted process. It was an incredible process. Um, but to sit front and center to these stories that were eyewitnesses and journal accounts of things that we didn't see uh, unfortunately, in media depictions of what was going on in the Arab world. So I find myself constantly referencing the book when people ask me what sort of stories were coming out of the Arab world during the uprisings because, you know, we had an opportunity to actually engage these stories in depth. These stories were three to 5,000 words and a journalistic piece is 800 to 1,000 words. So this was such a unique, incredible opportunity and I'm so indebted to Maria and, um, White Collar Press and Zahra for bringing me on board. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what what do I say about storytelling? I mean, I I decided to be a journalist because I wanted to to bear witness, and um, I'd always wanted to be one of those television news anchors, the ones that you know so articulately speak what's happening in the world. And then I quickly realized in college and very early on at CNN that was not what I wanted to do. That because I'm a, you know, probably a type in a lot of ways, um, the power is actually behind the camera. And, um, you know, I realized that the best journalists don't just bear witness or report on what's happening. You can figure out what happened today by looking in the palm of your hand and your device. Um, the best journalists tell stories. And, um, I think that what I have been doing for now 15 years is finding the characters that actually help create the best stories for CNN. And, you know, this book is probably one of my life's greatest achievements. Um, and, and I would have never thought I would say that probably 10 years ago because what I did with this book was, is completely antithetical to what I do in my job which is I tell other people's stories. I don't allow people a platform to tell their own story. And so um, I think the greatest gift you can give someone is actually that platform. And, you know, if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, the conversation would be very different. There was no Twitter. There was, I mean, all of that existed in some way, but it, it wasn't relevant. It wasn't part of the fabric of how we communicate. And now everyone has a platform. So we're saturated with stories. And so one of the concerns I have in, uh, you know, approaching a series like this now or even as we continue the series is how do these stories get, how do they, how do they continue to resonate when people's attention spans are really the size of 140 characters or, you know, two minutes or, you know, I mean, I was learning about Vine the other day, right? I mean, you know, in 20 seconds, you can upload a video, you upload a video that can only be 20 seconds or 10 seconds long, and then you share it on Twitter. I mean, if that's the depth and the context that the American public or any public's willing to go to to learn about something, that worries me. But um, I, I think that this this kind of storytelling will live on. Um, and um, And I really do believe that I don't view I don't view the work that I do as a journalist as separate from this work either. I think 
everything that I had as a journalist I put into this book. I mean, all of the les the lessons I learned about how to get people to do things and and how to coach people into um and even convincing them to do an interview, how to find these people, all of those things I I took into practice. But, you know, one of the things that we're actually realizing as a result of this, and I think May and Jamila will speak to this, is that when you create a platform like this and you create a, a gathering of storytellers, right, that in and of itself becomes a story, right, the gathering of the storytellers. So the stories that we all have to share about our experiences being a part of this is now a story in and of itself. And, and I think that's the gift that keeps on giving when you are able to do something like this. The 9-11 anniversary, and that obviously was a seminal moment in American history and um, uh, disparately impact the Muslim American community. Um, I want to ask you each a question about the legacy of 9-11 in the work that you do. And maybe I'll, I'll start with Maria. Um, your, so much of your work in journalism has happened in a post-9-11 context, and the media landscape has changed tremendously since 9-11 with the rise of citizen journalists and the speed through which information moves. Um, and the media has had a role in both creating the stereotypes that we, you know, try to you're trying to challenge yeah. in this book, but also in um, in challenging those stereotypes as well. If you look at the media landscape today, especially in reporting on the Muslim American experience, what do you see? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the opportunities? And what gives you hope? Well, I mean, when 9/11 happened, I was only three years into my work at CNN, so I was I was pretty pretty junior, um, very low on the totem pole, and I think um, I think in terms of how the media covers Islam, I mean I I feel like as a body or as a community of individuals, my colleagues and I are way more educated about what Islam is, um, the basics of Islam, right? Um, I think what we're not we're still not sure of is um, how to how to distinguish between how to sort of get past the 101. Um, you know, a lot of us, a lot of my colleagues, still approach stories about Islam in a very basic way, and 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 I think it's because they're scared of the complexity that is our faith. Um, you know, I I gave a talk of. Uh, a few years ago to a bunch of religion news writers of, in America. It was the Re Religion News Writers Association Conference. And, you know, these were a lot of local journalists that were talking about some of the challenges they face um, in covering Islam. And, you know, a lot of it is based on perceptions that people above them, the decisions that are made above them. So, for example, there was a woman who said, you know, I really want to try to show showcase the diversity that is in Islam, you know, and uh, hypothetically, you know, I, I wanted to do a story about soccer and how, you know, how soccer is being played and how there was this all, you know, all the, the masjid had formed in a sort of a, a youth soccer team. And so when they went to pick the photo that actually would go with the, the vision of, you know, or, the, or the go with the story about the, the Muslim soccer team, the editor specifically chose the bearded youth versus all of the other photos of the youth without the beard. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's some learning to do because a lot of people still have this perception or this sort of impression of what a Muslim should be. And, and that actually isn't just the white man's thing. Um, I think Muslims themselves have a problem with this. Muslims themselves, people in our community judge each other. And um, those are conversations, honestly, that are just starting to happen in our community. I think over the past several years that we're, we're sort of realizing this rich diversity that we have and the rich interpretations we have. And, and we're having conversations about those. But I think from the outsider looking in, there's still this sort of idea that this is one community, it's a monolithic community, and they all look like this, mm -hmm. and they all believe in this. And, um, you know, that's not going to change in my profession until more people like me get in the profession. I mean, that's really the, the honest truth. And, you know, what I have loved seeing um, in the 12 years since 9-11 is I'm, I'm, for the most part, not the only Muslim uh, journalist at the conferences I attend now versus like in 2002 I was and um, that's what I'm really proud of is that our community has really evolved in terms of realizing that journalism, civil society, politics, government, all of these spaces and places where you wouldn't necess necessarily find Muslim Americans engaging 
um, they're engaging way more, um, tenfold more than they ever were. Mm -hmm. I've seen that too, and I think Adina would, would agree. Um, it used to be the case that I think the professions that most many Muslim students would go into would be engineering or medicine. Increasingly, uh, our students are interested in journalism and law, and so they can go out and be advocates and storytellers and kind of affect social change. So I think we're seeing a generational trend or shift here as well. Um, Jamila, your doctoral work was on um, higher education, and you work as a university administrator. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the role of higher education in combating Islamophobia, the experiences of Muslim students on college campuses, and when you look at the climate now, what, give, what gives you hope about um, the possibilities of um, you know, higher education as perhaps, uh, in, inter, as, as perhaps an intervention or a critique of um, Islamophobia in American society? Well, the focus of my dissertation was uh, social stigma, gendered Islamophobia, and the stories of Muslim women in higher education, and juxtaposing those who wear the headscarf and those who don't, seeing if there are any differences in their treatment on and off campus. And it looked at women, uh, female college students, who were born and raised in the United States and attended higher education in the United States after 9-11. And it really, there are two eras, really, with higher education. There's pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And it's the same with a lot of Muslim women who I've interviewed. They have these two eras in their lives. Same with myself. There were more hope with the women that I interviewed, of course, from Michigan and women from New York City, a, a, a few of those in that area, where their experiences were less violent. Their experiences were less isolating. They felt there were there was more understanding of their difference, appreciation of their difference in the classroom. And I'm talking about the women, Muslim women who wore headscarf. There were more questions, uh, there were less, they felt less judged, they felt more support from even non-Muslim peers, and also from professors. Surprisingly, when I think I'm born and raised in California, I, I a lot of times buy into the belief that we're liberal and all those wow. kinds of things, which a lot of our recent ballot um, outcomes show that we're not. Yeah. But I I believe in that dream sometimes, and so I was really surprised in my research to see just how extreme some of the situations were for Muslim women who attended universities in Southern California. And for a lot of these women, there were instances of not physical violence, but verbal violence and intimidation, um, feeling isolated, not feeling a part of the community within the classroom, or being made to be, as I'm used to as a black person, <laughs> be that person who knows what it's like to be a slave. So the professor or the teacher says, well, you know about that, don't you? So having some of the Muslim women feel that they're being pointed out to speak for all of Islam and all, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> so um, those kinds of, of instances. And so that was disheartening, actually, in my research to find that because I really didn't expect to find that, especially in Southern California. The other interesting thing was to find just how much professors aren't willing to engage in the conversation about religion and their students. So in my study, I really aimed to talk to other Muslim women students in higher education who have possibly could resonate with these, these uh, study participants. And also I targeted university administrators and faculty because a lot of times in the classroom, there can be a situation where you have a Muslim woman and depending on what her beliefs are, she may not raise her hand in class or she may not make direct eye contact when you want to speak to her after class privately and tell her something about her test scores or she may not feel comfortable in a group. Then you may have a Muslim woman who's just the opposite. She's the loudest one in class. She always has her hand up. She wants to speak with you after class. That would be me. So <laughs> you have all of these different types of uh, people, but a lot of times the faculty had no idea. They just thought the woman's not interested. And they had this stereotype many times that they're, they had this surprise that the women were in higher education, but not the surprise with men, but they were surprised that the women wearing the headscarves were in higher education because their belief was that's not something they do, or if they do, then they're not going to use it anyway because they're just going, just going to be at home with their kids. Mm -hmm. And that is something that came out with uh, some of the women where that's what they wanted to do. 
get their higher education, get their degree, and be able to homeschool their children and be a part of their communities, where you had others who did go out into the workforce. Um, so it looked, it looked not, it wasn't such a bad picture in higher education. I think what the women overall showed that their main concern was for those who were hoping that their academic achievements would transfer into professional opportunities. They seemed to really worried about what do I do at the interview? Do I wear my headscarf? Do I not wear black? Do I wear a bright color? Do I tuck it behind my ears? Do I put earrings? Do I not put earrings? Do I wear a headband with it? I mean, all of these types of things. Or do I not wear it to the interview just so I get in? And then, you know, so they seem to be really worried about the professional outcomes. And so that's where the conversation kind of, I use theory based on social capital and uh, cultural capital to talk about that thing. Uh, and it just, it was, it was really, really interesting. Another interesting fact was, for some reason, I had about eight African American women from across the country, um, Muslim women, and they seemed to have this, this thinking that I can actually, I, I understand it. Where after 9-11, with their responses as far as how they felt and how they, what they experienced and how it made them feel, they weren't as troublesome and problematic because they felt like I've been there, done that, being a black woman in America. So when it was now not based on their skin color, but now it was based on what they wore on their head, they were thinking, well, I already know how to navigate this. So they kind of were used to it, which is a good and a bad thing. So it had less psychological ramifications, but it still is something that was harmful. But they just have the attitude more of these are participants in my study that were African American of, what are you going to do? Hold your head up high, go out, go on about your business, let the haters hate. Whereas some of the other women were really distraught over this. Some even contemplated taking off the headscarf. One, uh, she actually dropped out of school, but then later went to online university. Um, so we had, in the study, I had a lot of different outcomes, but the themes were kind of the same. Higher education, it's really the students who are educating the faculty. Um, and they worry mostly about their professional opportunity. May, your work, um, especially in the post-9-11 context, has really been bridging activism, advocacy, scholarship, art, media. Um, and in doing so, you've been involved in some very, I think, um, interesting and important coalition building, uh, multi-ethnic coalitions, multi-religious engagement with political actors, with law enforcement, with higher education. Um, young people. I don't know about the law enforcement <laughs> thing, but thanks. <laughs> I just have to put it out there. We're okay, being well, taped. That, that, yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about that work that you've done and um, the the people who have sort of come together after 9-11 for the purposes of advocacy for social justice and what, what, what gets you excited? What gives you hope, you know? So um, what's really interesting for people to realize, because they realize this very quickly, is they stand in front of a Syrian American woman who's obsessed with Malcolm X. And that's opened up interesting spaces for me. Um, when I was at UCLA, that was one of the first places that I was politicized. Actually, I'll take that back. I, I think just, you know, growing up as a woman of color who reads as being exotic or other just politicizes you very quickly when you live in a white dominant, especially conservative area, which I did. I grew up in a suburb that was at the moment, at that time, white dominant, conservative. Um, uh, mothers of children would conspire together to make sure that a girl that was half Mexican couldn't enter Girl Scouts. This was kind of the environment that I was raised in. Um, and then when I went to college, 9-11 uh, happened, and I was actually interning at a congressman's office um, his district, and when I heard all the calls that I got, again, Southern California, we can, we would consider it to be liberal, or we would think it was liberal, were just astounding to me. I got phone calls from people who um, wondered why the congressman was not proposing a bill that would ban people from coming into in the into the country if they had turbans. He was watching C-SPAN, um, and he was shocked that he didn't hear the congressman propose this. Um, Another caller asked if the congressman would ban Arabs from taking flight school. Um, another caller, um, he started out his call asking or telling me that, um, sorry, he asked me 
why the congressman isn't doing something about just rounding them up. And I was like, rounding them up? What do you mean? He's like, you know, going to the gas stations and just rounding them up. That's where they are. And I was like, uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, um, we know it's no white, we know it's no blonde haired, blue eyed German. We know it's not me. We know it's not you. Why don't we just get them? And I was like, thank God that this is through the telephone <laughs> right now. Um, and you know, I got phone calls that, um, people thought that I was going to send anthrax to them when they found out I was Muslim in the phone call. And that quickly, that quickly gave me the consciousness that, you know, there's, I'm, I'm marginalized. I'm something other. And when I went to UCLA, I linked up with a lot of African American students and African American student groups. And I seemed to, I, I felt like their story spoke to me. So when I was studying Malcolm, Malcolm X, um, and his speeches, reading his biography, I know this is actually a very common thing for people in my generation to be drawn to Malcolm X, um, black and non-black in the Muslim community. And there's tons of stories of people who even come back into our faith because of Malcolm X. Um, so I was becoming politicized, and I started working on um, inner-city after-school tutoring in Inglewood with the Black Students' Union. And when I went to Columbia for my master's program, I got involved in the prison industrial complex work, well, some, some abolition um, anti-prison work. In a very interesting way, I saw a flyer for a class that said hip hop and spoken word versus the prison industrial complex. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Why don't I just go to one class? I went to one class and then um, it turned out that I was working within a juvenile facility in the largest prison in the US called Rikers Island. If anybody is from New York and is familiar with that, they have a juvenile facility which is very unlike maximum security prisons across the US. And um, I worked with this group called Blackout Arts Collective, and their philosophy was to use art as a tool for social change. So we would go into juvenile facilities, and this was part of the class, some of the work, um, and put on workshops that were based on hip hop or anything that was relevant to the students and educate about the prison industrial complex. But you know, we soon found out that the 15, 16, 17 year olds there understood the situation of oppression much better than we did. So it was a very humbling experience. So um, I had I had a moment where going into these prisons that were mostly black and Latino youth, um, where I realized that there weren't many people that looked like me there. Um, students were always preoccupied with what I was. And um, I was like, why, why does everybody care where, where I'm from? And uh, I realized that I looked around and I didn't see anybody that looked like me who was coming in and trying to help them. And so um, it's always kind of been a mission of mine to be somebody within multiple communities. Um, and I always felt like solidarity building meant that I didn't just want you in my cause, I needed to be in your cause. And I needed to recognize the indivisibility of justice. So I became involved in a lot of work dealing with bridging black and Arab communities, but a lot of that revolved around honest discussion with where the tensions came in from. And a lot of people weren't ready to talk about that. Arabs weren't ready to talk about that. I actually went to a very interesting conference, um, an Arab women's conference in San Francisco this past April, and they had me talking about racism, ethnocentrism, and colorism in the Arab community, to their credit. And of course, it was women who started this conversation, and it was the Bay Area. <laughs> um, and it was it was really interesting because um, I brought up things that we hadn't talked about in a public collective space, like the term that's used to talk about black people in the Arab community, which is abid, which means slave. And a lot of people didn't think that, that there was something wrong with that. And so it was an educating process for people. And it was a process, actually, to have a conversation in public because there were a lot of Arabs there who also self-identified as black. There were Sudanese Arabs, there was Nubian Arabs, there was other Arabs who might not traditionally been thought of as black, but were also, but self-identified. Um, so, you know, this has been the heart of my sort of social justice activism is just really taking it back to community and 
finding anywhere that I can create those bridges because I feel like we have just so much similar, but we're just all afraid to talk about the taboos in the room. Good evening, but I want to open it up for um, all of you um, to make comments, observations, questions to the um, panel. Thank so. you for that. I We were just talking about this earlier today, right? I mean, I'm a token, and I accepted that yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, to back to my earlier point, I think... Um, what you know, I, I'm a pay it forward kind of person, right? I, I acknowledge I was a token a long time ago. I accepted that I embraced it. Um and uh I will tell you, I mean, I, I, I think I can say this with some confidence that if I had gone and I had to get approval to write this book, because any CNN employee that does that writes a book has to get approval through our standards and practices team. Um, anyone that goes out and does a speaking engagement or speaks to another media member has to get approval. So, of course, I had to get approval. Um, but I was very senior in my role when I began this project. And I often wonder if I had gone to S&P in 2002 as a very junior CNN person, um, would I have gotten that approval? Would, they, would, it, would it have been met with skepticism? Um, you know, I'm a person that really believes that... Uh, I mean, you pay it forward, but you also have to pay your dues. You have to do the work and gain the respect. Um, and I think that's what happened in, in my case. Um, but, you know, what has it been like? Um, you know, I, I won't lie. It's been frustrating. Um, there have been great moments. There have been not so great moments. You know, um, when we went in and, and covered the Tennessee mustard story, and, and we were able to re to do a, a complete one-hour documentary about what that community was going through. That I would consider a success um, in terms of my involvement at CNN because I was really able to touch something that I knew was going to have tremendous impact. And for once, we were actually just, you know, all we did was just go in and tell the story. And it wasn't even telling the story. We, the people told the story. The signs outside of the the mustard told the story and being able to uncover that. So there were moments of triumph and there were moments of sadness. I mean, you know, post 9-11, every time somebody said Al-Qaeda on the air, I, you know, cringed or Koran or, you know, I mean, those little things don't amount to some of the bigger things that I've been able to touch. Um, and I'd like to say that, you know, had I not been in the trenches with them on other stories, with my colleagues on other stories that weren't necessarily about my community, um, they wouldn't have been as comfortable walking up to me to ask me about how to pronounce this word, or you know, am I am I doing this? Am I doing the right thing? Is this? Can you read this script for me? And I think that just comes to to sort of being who we are, right? And you know, another reason I go back to the idea that Muslim Americans need to engage in these other spaces. I mean. I think for a long time post 9-11, people in my profession only called on Muslims because they were Muslim. So the only time a journalist will ever show up at a masjid is if they're doing a story about Islam, or they'll ever contact a guy named Muhammad is when they're doing a story about Islam. And part of that is our community's fault, because we don't put ourselves out there unless we're defending our faith, talking about our faith, talking about our community. And what we wanted to do with this book is to really humanize um, and almost deconstruct our our identities so that we're people other than just Muslims. And you know, a, I, I've gotten a lot of flack over the years for for going and talking to Muslim communities and saying, "Stop talking about being Muslim." And that's not necessarily what I was trying to say. That's how it was interpreted. I think what I was trying to emphasize is talk more about being American. Talk more about what you do in life versus who you are in life, right? Um, you know, one of my sort of greatest examples of how that might apply on air is like the day that, you know, the day that you see Muhammad um, Sadiq on the air talking about being a doctor, you know, and, um, you know, performing surgery on someone because, you know, that's in the news um, versus Muhammad talking on CNN about being m Muslim. Um, you know, the more Ali Valshis you see on the air, the more, you know, Reza Aslans you see on the air, the more, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but I think that that idea of presenting yourself as somewhat, I mean, and, and that is an Islamic principle too. I mean, Islam is sort of allows us the space to be able to be all of those things and Muslim too. And so I think that's, 
our community has to embrace that a little bit more. I would say there are, I can't speak for all of us, but I know many people who think the way I do, who are African American and Muslim. First I'll say I grew up in a community and my childhood mosque was really close to here. Um, and it was a majority black mosque at that time. And it was a wonderful place to grow up. We spent all of our weekends there, ate there, like just ideal mosque. And now that I have an almost two-year-old, I would have loved to have her in the same community. But when we moved and there was no mosque that was similar to that, we branched out to other mosques. And the majority of the mosques where I live are Arab majority. And I didn't have good experiences there, but I still went. Um, I went faithfully to pray Taraway. I went during Ramadan. I went on my Fridays off when I used to have Fridays off. And it was just the loneliest experience that I ever had. And I was like in a room full of people, a mosque full of people, but felt completely alone. And I started getting bitter about it. I was like, you know what? Forget these people. I was like, okay, we're all Muslim, but something's not quite right with me. Everyone else gets a salamu alaikum when they're entering and I don't. I say salamu alaikum when I'm entering or leaving, no response. And a lot of other women have had those stories who are African American. And the interesting thing is it also has to do with color. Are the African American women, the five, are they darker brown, medium brown, light brown? Yeah, so medium and darker is where I've seen, there's a difference there. There's the difference between just being black African American and being Arab American or Indian American, whatever. There's that difference. But then there's also within the black community, the lighter you are, the better you're received in these mosques. Because a black woman who's African American can be the same color or lighter than an Indian American. Yeah. A black woman can be lighter than the Arab American girl. Um, so it's more acceptable as far as marriage. So these women who are, I know so many women who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, never married, who are African American. And they're medium to dark. But the lighter ones, whether they're their sisters, their cousins, it's okay. It's not desired, but it's okay because the kids might come out decently white, right? So that's something, I mean, acceptably white. So that's something that you have to deal with as an African American woman is one thing is your marriage ability, which is an issue for a lot of women if they do desire to get married and reproduce within a marriage. Um, and I don't, I can't say it's getting better. I'm sure in some communities it is, but it's not in mine in most cases, except there is one mosque that was erected um, within the last few years and they do a really good job because the ones who erected it are second generation and they're from Pakistan, India, from all over the Arab nations. And there are a lot of converts. So you see a lot of white Americans, uh, Malaysian Americans, African Americans. Not a lot of African Americans, but there's such a mixture, there's not really a true majority. But you still kind of feel that true majority when the sermon is in Arabic and you're like, what's going on? You know, you, you, you still know it's not for you. So when I'm in a mosque, I want to hear a language that I can understand. I want to not feel that I have to bow down to some type of Arab superiority, whether it's in ethnicity, color, or language. So you still have things like that that women have, African American women, as well as other women, have to deal with. Um, I think in some communities, I know in New York, they have really vibrant communities that um, are African American majority mosques, but also that branch out and really try to foster collaboration with other mosques where they traditionally would not have collaborated on um, events. So I think for some, it might be getting better. For some, not much better. But I think as more generations hopefully get away from the colorism and the racism and the I'm more Muslim than you are because I speak Arabic or whatever the issue is, um, I, I hope that that will be less of an issue and it could truly be embracing what everyone always talks about within Islam. Oh, the last sermon of the prophet. And it's like, well, live it. Stop repeating it. Live it. So hopefully one day that'll happen. But for right now, I'm mosqueless. <laughs>
Yeah, you know, I mean, first of all, I mean, I'll I'll be honest. I I, I didn't expect the men's book to be half as good as it was. <laughs> to be honest with you, because I mean, I I just thought, you know, I mean, I, that book was really hard to put together. Um, getting men to like focus and do like. <laughs> Even, I mean, but, but you know, this there's this sort of th this barrier that already is out there. Like, you know, men don't emote. That this is just not, it's not manly to tell your story. It's not like, what do you mean I have to write 1,500 words? And where am I going to find that? But actually, I think the, some of the most compelling stories about American Islam are in that men's book. Um, there is There are stories about men serving in the military, um, you know, um, beautifully written stories about, um, how some of them came to Islam, how they navigate their, you know, their their sexuality. Um, there's a gay imam in there. I mean, there's there's so many different kinds of stories. I mean, personal stories about, you know, fatherhood and, and becoming a father for the first time. Um, navigating a career in medicine in an all Jewish sort of a Jewish hospital, you know, and pretending to be one of them in many ways, because this guy was light-skinned, um, so he could kind of pass, sort of. Um, but, I mean, I just think it's a good question. I mean, I think that, I think a lot of people, at least I, I would have thought, you know, people people have this idea about who Muslim men are, like, but I think when you read that All-American book, it really is, you you have no idea who uh, the diversity and complexity um that American Muslim men are facing right now. I mean, there's a dip when you, when you were talking Jamila about the stereotypes that women face, African American Muslim women in masjids. I mean, my my follow up to that would be, I wonder then what it would be like for an African American Muslim man in that same space. I mean, would it be as much of a stigma or maybe less because it's you know the gender roles? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, th that book actually, I think, if I could choose between the two in terms of providing some real depth and context, I would choose the men's book. I mean, unfortunately, the men's book didn't sell as well as the women's book because um, men are just not really great, you know, promoters of themselves, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I was just going to say, really? <laughs> <laughs> some are, some are. Um, but I think there's just there's a fixation with being American Muslim and female. Yeah, there's yeah, being yeah, there's a fixation course. with sort of the Muslim woman, right? Mm -hmm. The Muslim man is like, eh, yeah, okay, the Muslim man, right? Yeah, oh, I get it. You're not a terrorist. I mean, that's kind of <laughs> the narrative that one would have expected to see and hear in the stories uh, by Muslim men, but it's it's far from that. I'm not a terrorist kind of narrative that you get. Okay. Could I comment on the, um, I, I don't know about that, but um, just the um, the reflection about the the gendering of this sort of format. Um, the book that I co-edited included both men and women's stories. So it was really interesting to see what gets traction and what doesn't get traction. And I do understand there is like some sort of like patriarchal um, tendencies that are, um, consistent in many different fields, but I do feel like the attention given to women of color and women um, who are of certain faiths is is more deeply emphasized. So for example, um, there, uh, Maria knows the story because it was actually um, a, a very agonizing story. We were going to get a story from a Saudi woman who was a who was one of the first women to drive, or she was part of this women to drive campaign. And we worked so hard to get her story together, and we went so many different lengths to like getting Skype interviews and whatnot. And she was a media darling. She was she was actually on yeah. CNN. She was on all the outlets. We weren't able to get her story through a lot of uh, lawyer red tape. And um, we got a Saudi man story, and he tells a very interesting story about trying to live and exist as a Shia in Saudi Arabia, which is a story that is not very much told. And, you know, his story doesn't get any sort of traction because he's a man, you know? And there's an assumption that Arab men don't, for, for my book at least, um, Arab men don't have to deal with all the stigmas like Arab women would have had to deal with. And there's also this, you know, concept of um, the West saving 
the Arab women or the Muslim women. And so you see a lot of media trying to play up that story. And I also see how people want to tokenize me because they want to know, they want to have the gender perspective or also think that I um, was incubated in the West. So that's why I could be a vocal public Muslim, Arab woman, whatever you want to sort of attach to that. Um, so yeah, I, I've definitely seen a, a different reception with men's stories and women's stories. And it was really interesting to have a collection that kind of, kind of evenly had both men and women. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question about how to get this in the hands of a fox watcher, um, so, you know, that would be like my dream come true to like ship hundreds of copies of this book to the Bible Belt where I grew up in Georgia and just just think that it's going to happen. Like, they're going to pick up the book and read it, but that's not going to happen. And so there's two audiences to, I speak, the, the first volume. I mean, one is, I think in our hearts, we did this book for ourselves. Um, we did it for our community. I can't tell you how many Muslim women have written me, how many mothers and daughters and sisters to just say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to have something I can give to my child. When, when you know, they come to me and say, I don't fit in, I don't belong, I'm not, you know, I don't know, I don't have my place in this world. I now have something to give to them and say, look, there are lots of women just like you. And they turned out just fine, most of us anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, but I mean, one of the greatest supporters of this book was Pastor Bob Roberts. Um, who you all know, I mean, obviously he's, he's a liberal pastor, but to be able to have someone from a church in Bible Belt, Texas, Keller, Texas, to be specific, endorse this book wholeheartedly and say that he's going to have the women in his Bible study read it, um, I think is a really good start. Um, you know, to, uh, so you find your allies where you find them. I mean, for someone like me who grew up in the Bible Belt, Tacoa, Georgia, to even write a book and for people in Tacoa to find out about it and share it, um, I think that that also will resonate. I mean, it may not resonate now, but maybe over time. Um, so, I, you know, as much as I'd like to just ship thousands of copies mm -hmm. to every sort of small-minded town in the universe, I, I, I actually think that the allies are where we start and then they sort of are creating ripple effects. Um, but the core audience of this book I think we found was really our community. Our community needed this book mm -hmm. and wanted this book. And it, you know, I think if there was another book to be written, it might be, it might be by our children, right, who, who won't feel some of the same issues, who won't see some of the same stigmas, inshallah, that we have seen. Um, and they'll be coming at it from a different perspective. They'll be writing it for, you know, the global audience about what it really is like to be American and Muslim, right? Um, there's not a punk rocker uh, in this book, right? Um, that's a generation, three generations after mine. <laughs> so I would add, I think in conversations daily, I try to vocalize some of the things that are in that book with people I come across. I don't believe in missionary work or proselytizing or any of that, but just doing what I do every day at work from nine to five, doing what I do on weekends, going where I go. Um, I live out a lot of the stories or a lot of connections that people can make with breaking down stereotypes like, oh, Muslim women can do that. Muslim women can do this. Are you sure you're allowed to do this or that? Um, and so there's a lot of, I think more so because between the two of us, people would look at me with a scarf and say, she's more likely not going to be as inhibited as I'm going to be, or they wouldn't be surprised with her being normal and me not being normal. So when I act normal or I'm just being myself, sometimes it's revolutionary to people. They just, they don't understand it. Um, so a lot of times just doing what I do and being myself, not going out of my way to do anything, even though I'm really uh, deep within an educator, it, it lends itself to those conversations. And one by one, without realizing it, people, my colleagues at work, students, um, staff, employees, some of the housekeeping staff, janitors, the dining workers, they learn uh, terminology, salam alaikum, or they learn about Ramadan because I'm fasting. They'll bring me plates later so I can break my fast. 
Well, they'll learn about lots of different things. Like what I'm teaching my daughter, <laughs> does she wear, have to wear a headscarf? No, she doesn't. How about when she's older, if she chooses to? Oh, really, at what age? Like all of these different things that come about with conversation and relationships that we just build with people. One by one, they learn. Hopefully, they take that back to their family. And one story that I love is a girl who I'm sure didn't read the book. I saw her at Rite Aid. I was getting ice cream. And um, <laughs> she was in line with her friend. They looked like maybe 14, 13, 15. They were teenagers. And um, she just had the brightest smile when I walked in. And she said, Salaam alaikum. I like your hijab. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank you. So she was so proud of herself. I was like, thank you so much. She's like, yeah, I know what that's called. I was like, good for you. <laughs> so it let me know someone in her life taught her that terminology, and she thought enough of it to practice that terminology on someone like myself. And so that those kinds of things mean a lot. So if I can get someone to do the same thing, whether they practice it on another Muslim, who hopefully is nice, <laughs> or if they practice it at home with their family saying, oh, this is what so-and-so is really like. It's not like this then to me, that's a, that's a success. Now, if they can go pick up a book, that's yeah. even better. <laughs> well, and just a quick story. Comedy works very well. Um, what You know, you mentioned, if you looked at us, what sort of reactions we would get from just everyday experience of being out in public. And what I get all the time when people find out that I'm Arab and Muslim is, why don't you? You know, you know this thing, <laughs> that. Um, so that that experience happens. I was doing a yoga teacher. This is so LA of me. I was doing a yoga teacher training in Venice and sitting outside with a friend of mine who's African American, not Muslim. We're sitting, talking very lively, jovial, and telling funny stories. And this man walks past us and he started to interject himself in the conversation. And then he asked where I was from. Very typical question for me. Um, and I said, I'm Arab. And he said, oh, well, why why aren't you wearing that thing like that? And I, and I was too shocked to respond. And my friend jumps in and she says, oh, she doesn't, she doesn't wear a veil, but I usually do. And it's white and it has just open holes for my eyes and it's pointy on top. And I gallop on a horse and sometimes I burn a cross. And he had to laugh because his he realized how ridiculous his assumption was. <laughs> so I wish I had the, that wit about me, and I wish I was a black person who could say that. <laughs> but it's just it's, it's it's diffusing through comedy. It's yeah. It's the arts, and also I think that's something else we're doing because you're showcasing a lot of people in our community who are doing the arts or doing the comedy or doing or standing up in front of a class and teaching, um, and yeah. and that's doing a lot of the work of the dispelling. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, we didn't actually touch on that, but I think, you know, what has come since 9-11, and it took a long time for this to happen, is this idea that you combat stereotypes not by issuing a press release or talking <laughs> about how Muslim you are, right? You combat stereotypes by telling stories, but you're you're seeing, like, this burgeoning of, like, art and culture within the Muslim American community where they're openly expressing their faith through their art. So it's not necessarily, hey, I'm Muslim and I'm an artist. It's like their art kind of speaks for itself, Right. And, and and that is just a joy to see. I mean, I alluded to punk rock because in our session we were, earlier today we were talking about sort of this burgeoning sort of Muslim indie rock groups like forming all over the country, right? And, you know, post taqwa cores and all of that, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is an open expression of faith and identity and all of those things combined and, and the reconciliation of all of that. Yeah, and that's, you know, I... I um... I love Aziz Ansari for this reason, because um, mm -hmm. he's Indian American, he's Muslim American, but he's not defined by his ethnicity or his religion in the public sphere. He's not the Muslim comic or the Indian actor as previous South Asians have been in the United States. They're always defined by their ethnicity um, or their religion, but he's just a guy on television who happens to be Indian and Muslim. And I think that's an important step for, you know, at least as an Indian American, I think that's an important step for our community to just be able to see that. I've definitely had um, models. My essay title actually comes from something my dad has always said my whole life. He says, um, the universe is a university. Oh, and so, and the world is a one-room classroom. Yeah. Things like that. He has all these sayings. It won't be three o'clock till it's three o'clock. <laughs> um, but, and all these years I've gone and like suddenly I'll get it. And Aww. so University of Life, I got it. When I titled my essay, it was with the help of Mariette. Um, it telling me I had different titles and it's just like that's the title because the real theme of that essay is 
learning through all those struggles of not feeling accepted or feeling not feeling belongingness within the Muslim community and all of that. Um, so that was kind of dedicated to my dad in that way and giving him credit for that. But I think my dad is the number one person who's been um, my spiritual guide. Like ever since I was little, I'm the last of six kids. He would say sometimes, you know, thank you for being born into our family. And it just things like that where I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> you know, but now I'm like, wow. You know, Aww. he's like, you have a life's work and you needed to be born within the context that you're born to get Aww. that done. So hopefully we can help facilitate that path for you. And he always did that growing up. Although he was Muslim, he said, it's not something you inherit from me. It's not something you must be. I, you're born with your own truth and you have to pursue that. If it looks like Islam, great. If it looks like something else, you need to pursue that. And just having that freedom early on, going to Christian schools, but also going to the mosque and not feeling like I must be Muslim, I must be Muslim. It gave me the leeway to really explore all different types of faiths and see what really stuck. And of course, I always found my way back to Islam. And people would say the type of Islam I practice, I've been accused of being like a hippie Muslim and that kind of thing, um, or a new age Muslim. But really, <laughs> it's just I'm not really stuck in so much of the dogma. I'm stuck more in, and I think that does come from my upbringing, where my parents were not just, you're going to pray in an Arabic language that you don't understand. So I can say, oh, mashallah, my daughter has memorized the Quran without knowing what the heck it says. So they really wanted me to understand what I was saying, what I was praying. They wanted me to not just participate and perform religious identity, but they really instilled in me when I was really young to follow what feels right to me. If, Like my dad always says, another one of his idioms, is um, chew on everything. You don't necessarily have to swallow it, but accept everything that's given to you, chew on it. If it tastes good, swallow it. If it doesn't, spit it out. So that's, I've done that my whole life with knowledge, new knowledge that comes my way. If it's useful, it's, it just goes away. If it's, you, if it is useful, I keep it. If it's not, it just, I throw it away. But, um, I look at that with spirituality. When I looked at all these different faiths, I saw that it's like an ocean. And under that ocean, there's that undercurrent. And it's all the same. It's just different words, just like you have different languages that all talk about the same things, but it's all these different words used for it. So in all those studies, I thought, does it really matter if in the deep core I call myself a Muslim who's submitting herself to the one or that I call myself a Hindu that's submitting herself to the ones that are all the one or that I'm someone else who's submitting myself to the one that's a nothing one or like, you know, all of these things. It, it's to me, there's a truth. It's my truth. And the way that my dad raised me was to follow my truth. And if it happens to be the truth, if we can say there is such a thing, then so be it. But I really firmly believe in the Hadith Qudsi that says, Allah said, my, I am as my servant thinks I am. And I really hold tight to that because I think it's, I have a really personal relationship with my faith and a lot of my spirituality doesn't agree with other Muslims. But I cannot... Um, pretend that it does and I did for a long while but being true to myself has made me a happier Muslim and really following what I feel inside so with my daughter for example I want her to do the same thing I want to give her that leeway that my dad gave me I'm Muslim you don't necessarily have to be Muslim you can be like she talked about Shia you can be uh, Ismaili you can be whatever you want to be Ahmadiyya you can be not even a Muslim at all you can be an atheist um, I just want her to follow her truth that she's born with I found this evening's conversation incredibly rich, um, provocative, intimate, important, and I'm so grateful to our contributors. So please join me in thanking uh, Maria Ibrahimji, uh, Jamila Medina, and May Al Hassan. And thank you all for being here.